Okay, so uh, for today, I first, um, since yesterday in the tutorial, you computed um, the love numbers for Newtonian um, objects, and today in the tutorial, or maybe tomorrow, you compute them numerically. I thought I would spend some time um, to talk about how it's generalized to the relativistic case. So, um, I mean, yeah, as, as we saw yesterday, the main importance of these uh, tidal parameters is that they show up in the gravitational wave signal. So it's uh, for gravitational waves, that's the main measurable quantity for the in spiral that will tell us about the internal structure of neutron stars. So I will just not go through all the details, but just give you some uh, some idea of how it's done. Okay, so um, as we did yesterday, um, so we worked in the picture where we have an isolated body that um, is initially in equilibrium without any external forces, and then it is perturbed by some external tidal perturbation. So this, we again have a picture of a fluid body and then some exterior. So in GR, um, we know in the interior, well, we have to solve Einstein's equations, g mu nu equals 8 pi t mu nu, where t is the stress energy tensor, g is the um, Einstein uh, tensor, so it depends on the space-time curvature derivatives, second derivatives of the metric. And we also have stress energy conservation, grad mu t mu nu equals zero. And outside, all we have to solve is the vacuum Einstein equations, g mu nu equals zero. And um, so we compute and a solution in the interior usually, and a solution in the exterior, and then we match them at the surface because the solution should be continuous. So interior and exterior solutions must match. Or that's, yeah, we impose this con condition. And usually, um, we choose this matching at r equals r. But, um, I mean, this is all very general, so you can, uh, r equals r, where r is the radius of this object. Um, yeah, this is just, Sometimes you have objects, because this is very general, you can do it for any kind of object, and there are some objects that don't have a well-defined surface. So sometimes you, you cannot impose it at exactly at the surface. Okay, so what can you uh, choose for the stress energy tensor? So for black holes, of course, we just have vacuum, so the stress energy tensor is zero. But um, you could also now choose a fluid, which is uh, relevant for um, neutron stars. So then the stress energy tensor is um, energy density plus pressure, then for velocity of the fluid, and then the pressure. Okay, this is energy density. pressure, fluid for velocity, and G is the metric. Okay, um, you can also do dust, which is simply a pressureless fluid. It's T mu nu fluid. Um, with p equals zero. And then there are some more exotic choices. For example, you can have some exotic objects of 
scalar fields, that is possible. Um, so if you have a complex scalar field, just to give you an idea of, you, there are many different stress energy tensors you can choose to work with. Um, complex scalar field, um, so its stress energy tensor will depend on derivatives of the field, d mu phi star, so the, f the field is called phi here, uh, d nu phi plus the symmetrized thing, d nu indices down, d nu phi star, uh, d mu phi, and then the potential term minus g mu nu, d alpha, d alpha phi, um, plus v of phi. Okay, so, so this is um, just, you can have some model of compact objects that are constructed just of scalar fields that are called boson stars. Um, they consist just of this scalar matter. And um, yeah, this kind of stress energy tensor describes them. And usually you have to choose a potential that, um, because you know the gravitational force would make um, the scalar field collapse, but then due to a potential, there is some repulsive interaction that would uh, support this configuration against collapse. And this is the uh, potential for the field that is, you can have many different choices for that. Or you can set it to zero, but then you don't form a compact object. So let's just say, if you want, you can um, do these calculations for any kind of stress energy tensor you like. But usually, you, you are, obviously, you also have to uh, supply additional information in addition to um, Einstein's equation and stress energy conservation because you have to say something about here how pressure and energy density are related or here you have to say uh, some how the uh, scalar field, um, what its equations of motion are. Okay, but uh, so, so for this discussion we will choose the fluid stress energy tensor because that's really relevant one for neutron stars. And um, we'll simplify our task by considering non-spinning configurations. So uh, now we will choose T mu nu fluid and non-spinning. And we will use Schwarzschild coordinates. Okay, and then um, the first thing we write down is um, a general way to parameterize the space-time geometry of, of the unperturbed configuration. So let's first consider equilibrium configuration. No external perturbation, the object is just sitting there um, in its equilibrium. So equilibrium. Just um, writing down a general parameterization of the space-time geometry, we have a metric of the form ds0 squared, and then some metric function for the time-time component, dt squared um, plus 1 minus 2 m of r over r dr inverse dr squared plus the spherical um, element sine squared theta uh, d phi squared plus d theta squared. And here, um, phi at this stage and m of r, so phi is also a function of r, uh, to be determined. They are just some function I've simply chosen to write the metric in this form. I mean, I know um, because it's static and spherically symmetric um, from Birkhoff theorem outside, I know the metric has to reduce to something like this form. Um, so I'm not including any TR components or uh, R theta components and so on. 
So uh, static, spherically symmetric. Okay, and the next thing is to substitute this uh, metric parameterization into Einstein's equations in the interior. And, um, well, you already know what comes out, namely the um, Oppenheimer-Volkov equations, once you manipulate things and combine components. So, in the interior, um, this gives us the uh, TOV equations. And in the exterior, okay, also the TOV equations with zero uh, pressure and density, but also outside um, the configuration will look just like a Schwarzschild metric, a spherically symmetric um, Schwarzschild metric. So exterior, Schwarzschild, And um, they, the interior and exterior solutions have to match at the surface. So um, they already kind of immediately do match at r equals r. And um, yeah, that just, if you um, get that the, this metric function m, at which stage here has no interpretation yet, but um, once you, um, yeah, you go through everything, you find it is the interpretation of the mass as a function of r, and this becomes the constant mass of, of the object. Yeah, m of r equals r at the, at the surface and outside also. And that, I mean, you don't have to do any work to match it or, or, or always automatically comes out. So that's for the equilibrium configuration. Um, so now for the perturbations. Mm. I, I, okay, I didn't talk about one more um, thing you usually do is you, you not only, if you have the fluid, um, you not, not only have Einstein's equations and um, uh, stress energy conservation, but also the normalization of the fluid for velocity, because assume it's a time-like, um, time-like um, matter. So you also have, in addition, so you usually work in the fluid's rest frame. Sorry, I really forgot to say this. Um, frame, you, where the for velocity is ut, and then the rest is zero. It's just sitting there. And um, you also have f uh, the f yeah for time like um, matter you have um, g mu nu u mu u nu is minus one. So when you substitute this here, you see that only the t time component will contribute because u has zero components except for the time component, so you get um, gtt ut squared minus one. So gtt is e to the minus two phi, um, so ut is e to the minus phi. I think that's an, another um, input you need to, to solve all the equations. Um, so now um, we go on to the perturbation. Well, for, first let me see any questions. Yes? Yeah. You could alternatively sometimes, um, you don't impose stress energy conservation, but just the Bianchi identities, which are gr uh, gradient of G is zero. That's equivalent, but it's an additional condition. It's not uh, guaranteed that if you satisfy Einstein's equation, you also have the Bianchi identities. It becomes very complicated, so 
I'm going to give even less detail. Um, so um, we, what we want to consider, okay, we, we again want to consider, say, just the quadrupole, um, but a similar strategy can be applied for any multipole moment. So we want um, linear and then static, as we saw um, yesterday, we, we want, because we are interested in computing this love number, which is um, a static response, basically. Static, um, quadrupolar perturbations. Okay, and this perturbation um, will come in, in our picture from an external tidal field, but it could be, um, at this stage, it could be any kind of um, quadrupolar static perturbation. And that perturbation will result in perturbations in all the quantities in the stress energy tensor and all the quantities in the metric. So compared to Newtonian uh, gravity, we now have many more uh, variables to solve for, but it's a, a similar um, idea. Because yesterday you saw that um, also you had perturbations to pressure and density and the potential and you, you then substituted into the equations and combined things in various ways to eliminate variables and at the end arrive at a single equation for the perturbation to the potential. So here it's the same strategy but a bit more involved. So we, we write the metric as, um, again, some uh, linear perturbation, uh, ds0 squared, which we have over there, and we already solved for the functions in principle, plus uh, some perturbation that I'll call h mu nu. Okay, and th this perturbation will um, include um, perturbations uh, due to the external field and also due to the body itself, to, to, due to the distortion of the body itself. And I think, um, yeah, so again we have to solve Einstein's equations, interior, we solve first uh, delta g mu nu is 8 pi delta t mu nu, where d delta now in, in indicates the perturbed quantities. So we, we solve linear perturbations to Einstein equations. Of course, yeah, this is, is go, um, you have to work it out in, in detail because for example here, delta t mu nu, you have to work out what are all these things. Um, you have to ensure that the four velocity um, normalization for the perturbed and background field still remains valid and that stress energy uh, conservation still holds. So delta um, grad mu t mu nu has to be remain zero. And uh, yeah, so you have variables like d delta epsilon, delta p, um, delta u mu, and this perturbed metric components. That, that you all have to solve for in some way. Um, and then the same strategy applies as before. We decompose into spherical harmonics. And then um, we'll end up only with functions that are functions of the radius that gives us um, the information. The rest is just spherical harmonics tacked on. Okay, again, decompose. Okay, I'll just write. Yeah, okay, I cannot write. Uh, okay, um, I'll say something about this second spherical harmonics. Um, so in general, that kind of decomposition is very uh, complicated for when, when you consider the metric perturbation because um, it, in a general case, uh, so you have to use something that's called uh, depend because all the components of the metric transform differently under rotations. So uh, depending on those properties, 
You might have to use so-called tensor spherical harmonics or vector spherical harmonics that are quite complicated. Those are discussed in uh, Kip Thorne's article on multipole expansion. But fortunately, um, so Reggie and Wheeler uh, showed So those are, uh, it's an old paper sometime from the 60s. It's something called about Schwarzschild singularity. But anyway, they were also considering uh, metric perturbations. And they showed that because in GR you have a lot of gauge freedom. So you can basically choose a nice gauge for the perturbations where all these complicated tensor harmonics and so on get eliminated and you end up just with the perturbation again in terms of uh, the usual YLMs. So, um, yeah, simple, simple, uh, or gauge to significantly simplify. Okay, and in, in that case, uh, the decomposition is um, not only characterized by L and M, decomposition. So it's, uh, yeah, as, as any um, circle harmonic decomposition would, but there is also a parity now because you can have even parity perturbations and odd parity perturbations uh, plus uh, parity. That's just, uh, uh, yeah, what comes out of these emphasis. Uh, parity, which can be minus one to the L or uh, minus one to the L plus one. And for example, um, for, for the modes we are interested in, we have to choose parity um, perturbations. But if you're considering these uh, magnetic type um, interactions, I mentioned yesterday where you have the gravitomagnetic field that induces current moments, you have to use the odd parity sector. And Reggie and Wheeler showed that for small perturbations, these modes with different parity and with different L and M decouple. And um, so uh, we get simpler expressions. Small per uh, perturbations. Um, L, M. Parity modes decouple. Yeah, but um, for example, also if you consider spinning objects and so on, things can get more complicated because different things can mix and so on. So it's not so simple anymore. But here we will just, I will just continue to talk the simpler case. Um, okay, um, so in this case, finally, uh, one can show that the metric perturbation can be decomposed um, in the following way. Um, sum over m equals minus 2 to 2. So this is um, now for specialized to the case linear static, which means time independent. Um, so yesterday, remember, we had uh, in, in the one equation you derived for xi, um, there was a, a, a discussion. Normally, you would take a solution e to the i omega t and substitute. So normally, the, um, you would not only have a spherical harmonic decomposition, but then also an e to the i omega t. And then next week, you will discuss those omegas um, are the quasi-normal mode frequencies for different modes. But here we have uh, static, so we, need, we omit this factor. So, so it's zero frequency perturbations. So it's much simpler than you will see next week, probably. And quadpolar means L equals two. So I'm summing just M equals minus two to two. Y to M of theta pi. And then um, simply for each metric component that is, um, so, so in, in principle, of course, there could be all kinds of off-diagonal metric components now induced by the perturbation. But um, with this gauge and all these specializations, 
um, there's again just um, those same components. So some function h0 of r uh, dt squared plus minus 2 m over r inverse h2 dr squared and then another um, scalar r squared k of r um, d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So it's not so bad looking. I mean, if you think about normally, it could have many, many components in this tensor. But in the end, uh, with all these assumptions and gauge choices and um, yeah, uh, pr static perturbations, it just reduces to um, three functions here. So we have h0 that, that we have to determine, h2, and k. Those are the remaining functions in the metric we need. Um, no, um, because in, in fact, H0, so, so what I mean by um, static, in fact, is normally you could have here H0 or could be a function of R and T because you're just at the moment factoring out the angular dependence. So in principle, it could be a function of R and T. And usually, uh, one assumes it's e to the i omega t, uh, some, some other of h naught of r. But one just assumes it's a harmonic time dependence. Um, no, because, so in fact, h0, uh, h0 is going to be this analog of the Newtonian gravitational potential that uh, we are looking for. Yeah, so you're right in the sense that, um, okay, if maybe not for the time-time component, but in principle there could also be a TR component. There could be an H1 uh, dT dr in general. Um, and due to the assumption that it's static, this thing will vanish. One can show it um, but by working through things. But um, the, the zero, zero, unfortunately, we cannot just neglect. Okay, so I, I presume anyway you will hear more about this next week. I mean, yeah, there, there you probably are going to do a more full treatment. Otherwise, also, um, you can go back to maybe Emanuele Berti's lectures from last year. I don't know what exactly he talked about, but um, probably he mentioned something like this in a more general context, including this I omega t dependence. Um, Okay, yeah, so, so then <laughs> one just has to substitute this, the perturbation to the stress energy tensor, and um, make sure that the perturbed uh, or full fluid velocity, including the perturbation, is still normalized, and substitute into Einstein's equations and stress energy conservation. And yeah, similar to what you did yesterday, one just combines different equations to get a single master equation uh, for one variable, and we usually choose it to be this H0 here. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into details, but you can find components um, of Einstein's equation and stress energy conservation to get uh, some equation that looks something like h d squared h0 dr squared plus some coefficient d h0 dr plus another coefficient h0 is equal to zero. And here these coefficients a1 and a2 depend only on the background structure of the star. On, on the unperturbed fluid quantities. So, um, 
as you do maybe if you got to that part yesterday, you saw that in the end to determine the love number, what you needed was this quantity that we denoted by, by y, which was simply r, h, or, okay, we called it g. Yesterday we called it g, which is unfortunate. So, but h naught is supposedly to be the analog of, of g of r from yesterday from the tutorial. Okay, it's, yeah, not, not the same notation, but uh, roughly speaking, you know, you had the potential to delta u yesterday was denoted by g, and here we will see the time-time component of the metric gives you something like the analog of the Newtonian potential. And you saw yesterday you just needed r h naught prime divided by h naught where prime denotes the radial derivative to get the love number. Needed to get the love number or tidal parameter. Okay, so, so um, this afternoon and tomorrow, what we'll ask you, to, uh, or what we'll give you is, um, the, um, because as you see, if you define this variable, substitute into this equation and get an equation for y, y directly. So, so this equation then here becomes uh, first order ODE. For y directly. So instead of computing h0 and then at the end evaluating quantity, we'll have is a simple differential equation for y that comes from, from this relation. And so, so this is um, also exactly the analog of what you derived yesterday. You also had something like g double prime plus something g prime and something that did, didn't depend on, uh, on derivatives. So yeah, so, so we will give you this equation and then you will try to solve it numerically and, and find of numbers. Okay, so this is for the interior. Now what's remaining is the exterior solution. Um, and that's fairly simple because again, already Reggie and Wheeler provided for us the exterior solution uh, in terms of special functions, hypergeometric functions in general, or um, a special class of them uh, called associated Legendre functions. So, exterior. Um, yeah, all we have to solve is delta g mu nu equals zero. And um, for, the, for this kind of decomposition of the metric, this, as I said, was done by Reggie and Wheeler already. They solved for these um, perturbation functions. So, um, h zero is known in terms of hypergeometric functions or associated uh, Legendre functions, special functions. And it has the form um, H naught is some coefficient. Again, there are two independent solutions. One is um, growing at, at large distances from the object and one is decaying. Um, plus C2, P22, and these are um, Legendre functions, so Q22, P22 um, are associated Legendre functions. You don't need the details, but um, just to know they are available, they're a bit complicated to write out. Um, and this solution turns out to be decaying at large r. Large r, where r is the distance from the center of the star. And this here is growing. That's exactly um, what we're looking for because um, we define these multipole moments of the body in terms of asymptotic behavior of the potential 
outside the star, and the potential is related to this time-time component of the metric. It says uh, decaying at large r. Sorry. <laughs> and here it says growing. So we can compare that. Um, compared to definition of qij and eij of qij. OK, now, now that's a bit an unfortunate notation. So this Q is the special function. It's not the quadrupole. Yeah, that's just the standard notation for it, I guess. Um, so q, uh, let's say 2m and e2m. So we wanted to define this as um, by writing the full metric as minus 1 minus 2 u effective, where um, u effective had the expansion m over r, which comes from the unperturbed um, metric at large distances from the star. And then we had these decaying uh, solutions that encoded the multiple moments of the distorted body itself to r cubed plus order 1 over r to the fourth. And then we have also plus added to that the growing series, 1 half e m r squared y 2 m plus order r cubed. So it's always. This was our sort of definition of what read of the multiple moments um, asymptotically, I should say. This is all asymptotically. For large R. Okay, so, so then from, from this, comparing this to this expression, we can identify what these C1 and C2 coefficients are in terms of Q and E. And then again, we can match to the interior solution at the surface by considering this quantity Y that we had. And so similarly, we can obtain an expression for the love number. Um, so, yeah, I, I not, cannot really say very much about it. I mean, just uh, to say, um, consider why, well, which we had there, R H naught prime over H naught, um, evaluated at R equals R to match interior and exterior solution and get K2. K2 will be, then be a function of Y um, evaluated at the surface and the compactness of the star, M over R. It's for asymptotically large distances where the space time is almost flat. So it, it is, this is what we had for the Newtonian potential, yes. But the point is, um, so this U effective is related to this H0, which in general is more complicated. It's not, it's not just a simple series. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> compare limit r goes to infinity of h0. h0 equals c1 q22 plus c2 uh, p22. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You have to um, expand this for r going to infinity and then comparing 
to this, then pick out the one over r cubed coefficient and then see how it's related to the quadrupole. And then similarly for the tidal field for the other one. Yeah. And you can even, yeah, you can show it that uh, yeah, everything, even the differential equation and everything reduces to the Newtonian result in that limit, yes. If also the body is, has weak gravity. Okay, so yeah, this function you will compute today or tomorrow for um, an equation of state. And um, so now I just, yeah, okay. Uh, one feature of that to note is that K2 is zero for a black hole. I might have said this before, but um, that's an important property. So K2 equals zero for a black hole. So this is, um, yeah, one distinctive, uh, one distinction between black holes and uh, material bodies. And uh, yeah, so we often saw this tidal parameter, so we had lambda equals two-thirds k2 radius to the fifth. So this was, this uh, lambda was what showed up in the gravitational wave phasing, and it's related to this k2 that we computed here or yesterday on the worksheet by simply multiplying by the radius to the fifth power and numerical factor. Okay. Um, so this was um, for the response of the neutron star to a tidal perturbation when we look at um, its asymptotic gravitational potential or space-time geometry. But um, of course, neutron star also responds in other ways, for example, by deforming its surface. And um, so in GR, it's not necessarily, or it's not the case that um, the perturbation in the asymptotic gravitational potential is the same as the perturbation of the object itself, because there are many nonlinearities that come in. So there's um, another type of love number that's called the surficial or shaped love number that characterizes the deformation of the surface of the neutron star. And I just want to mention so you're aware that, uh, you know, these are not the only characteristic parameters. So we have surficial love numbers. If we have an object that deforms um, and its unperturbed surface is at R, okay, let me exaggerate it a bit, <laughs> then its perturbed surface would be at um, R plus delta R. Okay, maybe it's too small, but okay. Uh, so let me write it out, unperturbed surface, or it could even be generalized to um, isodensity contours. It doesn't necessarily have to be the surface, but then um, the expressions are a bit more complicated if it's an interior uh, density contour. Um, is that R equals R, and perturbed, once um, the star is sub subjected to tidal perturbations, again, um, it's at R equals R plus delta R, let's say. And now how do we define um, delta R? Because um, again, in general relativity, it's, I mean, this R is kind of coordinate dependent, so it's not a good statement to use. Instead, we have to look at something related to the curvature of that surface. So um, in GR, uh, this de deformation, surface deformation, um, by intrinsic geometry of the surface. So what does that mean? It means uh, intrinsic geometry of the surface. Or, yeah, you could embed it in some space and then define it, but uh, let's just stick with 
this. Um, so it's defined by the intrinsic geometry. So that means I have to write down what the metric is for that surface. So that metric uh, for the surface So first of all, I'm only considering now a spatial surface, so I can um, ignore the time part of the metric. And um, so I'm, I just have uh, the radial and angular part. So the ds squared is going to be r squared, because I'm looking at the surface that would be r equals r in the background. And then I l again linearize in the perturbations to delta r over r. Because normally I would have to have the full perturbed surface squared, but I say the perturbations are so small I can ignore delta r squared. And then the angular part d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. Okay, so I've simply specialized because um, I'm fixing the radius to be the radius of the distorted surface. So I just have to consider on that surface how does the metric look like if, if I vary um, the angular direction. It means, yeah, information about the gravitational potential or the space-time geometry. So it's a bit, a bit different. It doesn't it doesn't make any reference to what, how the object actually deforms. It just tells you how is its gravitational field affected by the perturbation. And in Newtonian, those are, of course, directly related. But in GR, um, OK, there's also a relation, but it's more complicated. OK, and then um, to define these love numbers, again, if I have it's not such a good definition. I should um, compute a curvature scalar quantity. So what is usually done is um, to compute the Ricci curvature of that metric. Metric for, yeah, let me just say here deformed. Uh, just to be clear. Okay, once we compute the Ritchie curvature, um, so that you can read in either a paper by Damour Nagar called Relativistic Tidal Properties of Neutron Stars, or um, a paper by Eric Poisson and collaborators called uh, Relativistic Theory of Surficial Love Numbers. So they kind of, or, or you can just compute it yourself. It's not so difficult because it's just two-dimensional. Um, but you find for the curvature, let's say it's curly R, for the curvature is equal to um, 1 over R squared times 2. So this part would be for a sphere. It's just, yeah, this is what comes out for a sphere, 2 over R squared. Um, here, which is the unperturbed surface, plus some uh, delta change in the curvature. And this delta r can be, again, expanded in spherical harmonics. So it's minus 2 sum over l equals 2 to infinity. In general, um, l plus 2 over l, um, h l r to the l plus 1 divided by m. And then tidal field and STF product of unit vectors. So it's a bit similar to the love numbers. And these HLs are the shape love numbers, or superficial love numbers. And so for l equals 2, it reduces just yeah, I don't even know if I have to write it down. Uh, for H L H two R cubed over M E I J N I J. Yeah, 
the, that's just what comes out if you specialize to L equals 2, but usually you can write it in this form. So here again, this is the tidal field, the same one we had for the other perturbations. These are unit vectors. So again, you could use spherical harmonics. And there are some prefactors that come from the expansion. And um, one interesting thing is, so it turns out you can um, express these HLs in terms of the uh, gravitational love numbers KL. So you have the relation between love numbers um, HL is equal to some AL1 or AL um, plus BL KL. Yeah, and these are some complicated functions. In Newtonian theory, this AL reduces to 1 and the BL reduces to 2. So it becomes very simple. Um, exactly, that was the next thing I will say, yes. Because um, for the neutron star, this K is, uh, for the black hole, the K is 0, but this coefficient is non-zero. And in fact, for a black hole, um, so it means it's quite interesting um, that, you know, the horizon of the black hole deforms in response to tidal perturbation. In asymptotic gravitational field, you don't see the um, imprint. For black holes, HL is non-zero. And in fact, it's simply a pure number. So for the L moment, it's L plus 1 divided by 2 L minus 1 L factorial squared divided by 2 L factorial. So, yeah, it's, it just depends on L. It's not a function of anything else. So, yeah, let's put the black hole here. So that concludes what I wanted to say about the love numbers. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I should also mention maybe one thing I didn't mention. There are also, um, yeah, in fact, I forgot to say two more types of love numbers I wanted to mention because um, there have recently been many uh, papers on so-called universal relations between all kinds of quantities that characterize a perturbed neutron star. Um, so there are also, of course, uh, other types of love numbers are uh, gravidomagnetic. So we, we had yesterday, we had um, this gravidomagnetic field, which was some epsilon tensor applied to the Riemann tensor, if you remember it. So we had, um, yeah, I, I don't write down the formula here yet again. So we have SL is equal to minus sigma L, BL. So here, these are the induced current moments. Which have no Newtonian analog, so we don't have good intuition for, for what those are, but it's basically yeah, some similar to these mass induced moments, there are also current moments, and this is the gravidomagnetic field. And um, the sigma is just, um, again, a love number, or love numbers. Yeah, those are gravidomagnetic love numbers. And as I said, um, to compute these kinds of perturbations, uh, you have to look at the odd parity sector in the uh, perturbation expansion. And um, so there, there, the moments are defined in terms of the time-space component of the metric in terms of GTJ, so some time-space component of the metric, not the time-time. Um, yeah, and you need odd parity perturbations.
But, um, yeah, uh, for these universal relations are not between odd and even parity quantities, just between um, even parity sectors. And finally, um, there are also rotational love numbers because rotational, because, um, so we've considered a non-rotating neutron star so far. If you imagine there it's slowly rotating, you can treat the rotation as a perturbation to, to the equilibrium configuration. And you can ask, you know, what's the um, induced deformation rotation because if the star is rotating around a, say the z-axis um, then it will deform mainly at the equator because of the rotation so again um, the main imprint will be a quadrupolar deformation so again you write down a relation q rotational is equal to lambda rotational e rotational it's always this type of um, linear response. And then this E-rotational is in the Newtonian limit. It's just omega squared, where omega is the spin frequency of the star or um, the uh, centrifugal potential. This is more where it com comes from. Okay, um, and again, you define this in terms of very similar to the tidal part, um, asymptotically, it's um, Q rotational over R cubed and E rotational, E rotational R squared. And you, you sort of apply a similar strategy to compute those numbers, except it's for the spinning case and the perturbation is from due to the rotation itself, not an external influence. Um, no, an irrotational configuration is usually the, the um, approximation because it's very difficult to get them tidally locked. Um, so, so usually we just assume well, well, so we exp maybe probably you yeah you already heard about the spin down um, of pulsars, and so because in the bi closed binary systems that LIGO might see, um, p the pulse uh, the neutron stars are supposed to be very old, so they are supposed to have spun down. I mean we wouldn't from standard scenarios we wouldn't expect some um, millisecond rotational neutron star to be there. So, so that, um, for, for the um, tidal love number to compute it and um, the rotational love number, it doesn't matter what assumption you make. But then here, for these current moments, it make, makes actually a crucial difference if you assume um, it's irrotational or it's, it remains stationary under perturbation. Because depending on what you assume, this coefficient will have an opposite sign and sort of give the opposite effect that, than what you would expect. Okay, so if there are no further questions, let's now, um, yeah, let's come back to gravitational waves now. Because yesterday uh, we already got quite far in deriving the effect of tides onto the binary system. So we showed that uh, tides have two kinds of effects. Um, it, one case, uh, one is that some energy goes into uh, deforming the neutron star, so it changes the total energy of the system. And the other is that the moving tidal bulges contribute an extra bit to the gravitational waves. So that changes the energy loss. So let me just remind you a bit um, what we had before. So we had uh, that energy goes into deformation. So 
we found that E of omega, where omega was the orbital frequency, um, was minus one half mu m omega to the two thirds, which is just the point mass part. Um, and then we had one minus delta E tidal. So that's uh, one thing we had. And then moving tidal bulges, tidal bulges contribute to gravitational waves. So that um, modified the total quadrupole of the system. So we had something E dot gravitational waves was minus 32 over 5 um, mu m to the 4 thirds, omega to the 10 thirds, and again, 1 plus delta E dot tidal. So I'm not going to write out what we had for these delta E and delta E dot, but um, we derived yesterday in the Newtonian approximation what those were. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll write here Q total is Q orbit plus Q J. Um, okay, and then we said, okay, we now um, we know the, know the total energy of the system, and we know um, there's some energy loss to gravitational waves. So that energy loss must back react to change the total energy of the system to, to have a um, consistent relation. So then we could say um, orbital evolution due to gravitational waves. Um, let's say emission, but I mean, yeah, it, it's not really emitted, they're more generated. Let's say, maybe say generation. Um, so we imposed that uh, the energy lost in gravitational waves has to balance the change in energy of, of the system. So we had that the change in orbital frequency with time is given by E dot gravitational wave divided by dE d omega. And then we could um, derive the result that d omega dt was in fact accelerated by the tidal interactions. So it increases faster than you might think just from point particles. Um, and this increase goes as a high power of the frequency. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just, for, to remind you, I'll just keep it very general. And here, this curly M was the trap mass, was uh, mu to the 3 fifth, M to the 2 fifth, Sharp mass. Okay, and so today, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just remind you why this is called the trap mass because now the next thing we want to do is look at the actual gravitational wave strain that comes from such a binary. Okay, so I assume you kind of, for, for gravitational wave, You've probably heard, um, you know, uh, to compute those waves, you linearize Einstein's equations, and then um, you uh, finally end up with a wave equation if you use the trace reversed metric perturbation um, and a certain gauge uh, that is yeah, it's just a wave equation with some source where the source um, contains contributions from the field itself and from the actual material source. So, um, yeah, 
Um, I don't know how much background I should give. So generally, uh, for gravitational waves, I guess um, you can look back at Cliff Will's lecture from, from last year. I'm sure he talked about how to, given a binary system, how to compute the waves at infinity that come out. Um, so, so from uh, linearized Einstein equations, gives you some sort of just schematically box, uh, which is the flat Minkowski box acting on the trace reversed metric perturbation is some source. Okay, and you can solve that uh, very easily in, uh, I mean, theoretically, by just writing down the formal solution. So we get H is simply um, the integral of S now at the retarded time. Um, yeah, so this is not really so important just to, maybe if you've seen it before, to remind you where things come from. In the end, we will not use this. We'll go to the already simplified result, um, divided by, again, uh, x minus x prime, uh, d cubed x prime. Very schematically, just just to say um, you, what the reasoning is from linearized Einstein equations, you get some sort of wave equation with some source that you can formally solve. And then um, you do an expansion for large distances asymptotically. And um, you assume uh, slow motion. So, so you get basically a multipolar expansion again which, yeah, you can also read in Kip Thorne's review article more about how this comes about and um, how to expand this and everything. So eventually, um, for slow motion, weak gravity sources, uh, you finally end up with the fact that this edge is just given by the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of the source in the leading order approximation leading order and was, um, weak field source. Um, so then you get just Hij is given by 2 over r q double dot Ij total, but at the retarded time because um, so, so this now describes the deviation from Minkowski space at large distances from the source. And um, you're saying that deviation from Minkowski space is uh, created by the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of the source. But it took some time for the wave to propagate to you. So it's at, evaluated at the retarded time. And um, yeah, this uh, falls off as one over the distance to the source. Okay, so this is for um, Hij. And then um, what actually gets detected is um, not this directly, but a dimensionless strain. Um, so gravitational wave strain at detector. Detector. So um, it's given by uh, denoted by h of t is f plus h plus of t plus f cross h cross of t. And um, so f plus and f cross are some beam pattern functions that characterize how the detector is oriented with respect to the source. So de depend uh, beam pattern functions. Um, yeah, de depend on look direction on the source. And then H plus and H cross are the polarizations, which are simply, um, so H plus cross can be written in terms of a polarization basis, 
uh, similar to sometimes you um, choose a polarization for EM waves, QI, QJ, HIJ polarization. Just to um, say sort of, you know, uh, we're going to be mainly interested in computing what this actually is, and then this is directly related to something that the detector measures. Okay, so, um, yeah, so from yesterday, we in fact already had, um, so, so this we can compute, in fact, yeah, what we had yesterday, we took some time derivatives of QIJ total. We took three derivatives, but here for the waveform, we need only two. Um, so let me just remind you what we have. Um, so we had something like Q double dot IJ total was um, two mu R squared omega squared um, um, two mu R squared omega squared times this correction factor from the tidal effects, one plus three mb lambda over u r to the fifth. And then we had these uh, vectors, phi i, phi j, minus n i, n j, where um, n i was x i divided by r, where these are relative coordinates in the binary system. And phi i was defined such that v i, which is x dot i, is equal to r omega phi i. And we assume circular orbits. Yeah. So this was what we had. But then we said we don't like to express things in terms of r, which is a gauge-dependent quantity. We instead want to express everything in terms of the frequency. And we had, in fact, a relation between r and omega that we can now use. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to substitute explicitly. So here we use uh, m to the one-third uh, omega to the minus two-thirds squared times one plus two delta r of omega. We have to substitute, and here we just substitute um, m to the one third omega to the minus two thirds, because we again linearize in the tidal perturbations. And this delta r of omega we obtained, um, well, for, from the action by considering the Euler-Lagrange equations for r and then saying it's on a circular orbit so we could solve for r as a function of omega. Yeah, that, that's just to remind you, yesterday we worked this out even, we took one more derivative of this thing. And so the point is now um, these things, okay, um, so uh, yeah, these things here are, are going to give us something like um, cosine 2 phi or sine 2 phi once we write it out. I mean, I don't, I don't want to write out the entire matrix just to say this is um, cosine 2 phi, sine 2 phi, and phi is going to be the integral of omega dt. And omega we have to compute from this equation, this, this differ, differential equation. So when, when we integrate this, this gives us omega of t, then here we get um, phi as a function of t by doing one more integration. Okay, so finally, let's write down the waveform and then um, end for the day. Um, 
Finally, one can write, in, instead of having all these beam pattern functions and polarization vectors and everything, we'll just write the waveform as some function of the angles and orientation and polarizations uh, divided by the distance to the source, uh, which is the luminosity distance. And then, um, okay, uh, yeah, this cannot now be seen so easily, but basically when you combine this factor, um, you will get something like, uh, this, this will give you something like the trap mass times trap mass times omega to the two thirds. So this is immediately where the trap mass will come in. Because what do we get from here? Uh, let's see if we can just see it here. So we have um, two mu r squared omega squared, say point mass, just to see the prefactor. Um, is two mu uh, m to the two thirds, omega to the minus four thirds plus six thirds. So it's two mu m to the two thirds, um, omega to the two thirds. Okay, and this mu m to the two thirds, how can we write it? Um, so it's supposed to be equal to, uh, okay, I don't have much room here, sharp mass times uh, trap mass to the two thirds. And um, trap mass again maybe is defined here. So yeah, if I have trap mass to the five thirds here, it should be mu m to the two thirds. So I can write it simply as trap mass times m to the two thirds. So what I get then here is trap mass times um, m omega to the two, two thirds. Um, okay, I'm already on the next page. I think. Um, and then cosine or sine, whatever uh, comes out from, from this projected onto the beam pattern and polarizations and so on, um, cosine of twice um, omega dt. And then uh, some tidal corrections. Let's say just point mass. <laughs> Newtonian. Okay, and then um, that already in indicates, okay, this gives the gravitational wave strain, and you see the phase of the signal is twice the orbital phase, so the gravitational wave frequency is, is yeah, twice, or the frequency is twice the orbital frequency, so the gravitational wave frequency is equal to um, to f orbit for, for this case. I mean, at, well, to higher um, post newtonian order, you get higher harmonics of the phase, or uh, if you have spin or precession, eccentricity, these higher harmonics will become more and more important. But the dominant um, emission is from, from this in the Newtonian approximation. Okay. Um, yeah, and you, com you compute this uh, frequency again by integrating this kind of equation. Um, yeah, maybe that's, uh, yeah, so you can see basically, um, so if we look back at what we had for the second time derivative of the quadrupole, so we had some little corrections here coming in into the amplitude. And um, in the phase, of course, integrate this equation, we will also get some tidal correction. But um, yeah, this will, maybe we'll talk about this tomorrow, how various parameters enter into the phase of the waveform, because the phase is really the most important quantity. Yeah, so f for today, let's just end here. Ah, yeah, yes, this is, so this is a point mass approximation. This gives you the standard trap signal for the in spiral. 
Um, uh, for this signal, so there would be here a tidal correction plus uh, uh, due to tidal, but the most important is going to be here um, in the phase because we have for the frequency evolution, so we have to integrate this frequency evolution to get the phase and we have the tidal corrections here. And the point is, um, it will be, um, let's say this is phi, phi, phi gravitational waves. So phi gravitational waves will be some um, point mass part. Or yes, let's actually say Newtonian point mass. Okay, and then come various corrections. So, so this Newtonian piece is actually quite interesting. So you see, it's, it will just come from this prefactor. So it depends only on this chirp mass. So, so this gives us only the chirp mass. But then there come one plus um, m omega to the times a one pn correction. And this one pn already depends on the chirp mass and the reduced mass. So this is already giving us more information. And then you go on, spins come in, and so on. And eventually, you will, you will get have to skip many uh, dependencies on the frequency. You get uh, something like m omega to the 10 thirds now. And then uh, you have lambda, this, this combination combined that we looked at yesterday at the very end, uh, where both in true neutron star case, both contribute with different factors of the mass. So, and the point is that um, all these parameters, so if, if we have here now chirp mass and reduced mass, and here we also get chirp mass, reduced mass, and lambda, um, but with different power of the frequency, we can uh, disentangle that in, in data analysis.